Now, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about sex for a while, okay? <laughs> Hope you don't mind. The culture creators planned, the culture creators, and they are culture creators, planned out a hypersexualized society a long time ago. The goal was to remove love from sex, make bonding obsolete, and destroy the family unit. Most people look at each other as sex objects now. And um, it's true, I mean, this is sex in the city, isn't it? This is pickup culture. This is just, this is like um, where sexual activity is just a consumer, it is a kind of consumer product. And I don't think, it, on the scale that we see in society today, this is not healthy. It's not healthy. It's, it's, there's very, very, there's many, many people now, uh, both men and women, who just have not fallen in love. They've not felt an emotional bond with their partner. It, the, the, their relationship is based on just lust and purely um, practical purposes. There's no emotional bond there. It's, it's, this is not universal, and this, this agenda has not been completely successful, but it's being worked on. It's being, it's being seen as cool for that. I think we, we kind of laugh at people, especially men, who fall in love now. They kind of said, oh, he's got it bad. Have you noticed that? But the other guys are going around, <laughs> the, other guys, <laughs> the other guys go around, like, uh, having casual, lots of casual sex and things like that. There's nothing, there's nothing immoral about casual sex. But it is, if it takes over your entire life and it replaces emotional bonds with people, then it is. Because an emotional bond with someone is essential for raising children, for forming a family and raising children. Families cannot be formed without that without that emotional bond between a man and a woman and the creation of children. Because without that, the children are brought, are, brought, are brought up in a pathological environment. And that brings us on to another subject here, the family. The family, the, 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 I think the sexualization thing is, is primarily about this. It's about preventing the creation of the family unit. The family unit is, has been the way by which people are nurtured, children are nurtured, since we became human, since before we were human. Today, apes, and cr apes, gorillas and chimpanzees, they live in the nuclear family unit. Mothers and fathers bring up children. Many other species do, non-primate species as well. The, the, goal, the, the principal goal of cultural Marxism is to replace the natural with the unnatural, to break things down, as, as Yuri Bezmenov said, to break down everything, to break down all bonds between people, as he said, husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, or, or your, your friends, your brothers and sisters, Parents with children are being torn apart. Um, communities are being destroyed. The, the, one of the reasons pubs are closing, and they've had the smoking ban has, has been very, very bad for pubs, um, and other things like that. The reason a lot of them are closing is to break down communities so there's nowhere where people can really go and congregate. If, if you take a pub away, where, where is it you can go? You can go to people's houses and things like that. But then, church. yeah, ch churches as well. I mean, of course, yeah. I mean, very, very people, there used to be sort of communities built around churches as well. Whether you're religious or not, I mean, it's, it's, quite, a nice, it's quite a nice thing to actually do this. I mean, I'll, I come from a Roman Catholic family. And I must admit, I did, even I lapsed, I'm not, no longer religious. I, I mean, I, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. But I did still go to Mass, and I still did spend time with people, because it was a community. It was, it was a community over which we were all... We could all associate. It was a, an in-group which, which we could all be with each other. And that kind of gathering is now no longer encouraged by people. I think the uh, scene in 1984, where, George, where Winston's being tortured by, uh, by O'Brien, is very, very telling. Because at one point, he says, there will be no love except love of Big Brother. And that's uh, very, very interesting, because there, there is the... The goal, I think, for the New World Order is for there to be only one relationship at all in society, and that is between the individual and the state. The state, in a sense, takes over. You break down the... the you, it becomes your lover, your mother, your brother, your sister, your friend, everything. It's broken down. And it's replaced by simply that one relationship. It's all unnatural. It's intended to be unnatural. It's intended to break down. It's, there's many. I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you in a little while, towards the end of this talk, exactly how extreme, to what extreme levels I think they are going to. They're going to destroying natural biological humanity. Because it's actually quite frightening the, the, the levels they're going to go to and what we, what we face if we don't put a stop to it. Silly daddy. <laughs> now this is, um, this is actually, I'm going to talk about children's TV. Now B the BBC has a long tradition in children's broadcasting, which means it's very important from a mind control point of view. Get them young, 
get them in there, and one of the, if you want to break down the family, you have to make the kids look at their, look at their family as um, something not very cool, and there's several ways to do that. In this case, one of them is the denigration of the father. This is not because the New World Order likes mothers particularly. They don't. They don't like mothers either. If you have Brian, has Brian Gerrish spoken here? If you have Brian Gerrish? Yeah. yeah. He is a very, very interesting man because he's identified a lot of this through organisations such as Common Purpose, which is connected to the Fabian Society, which is connected to the Tavistock Institute, which is all part of this, this fifth column, this, this infiltration organisation, this infiltration movement, cartel of... Uh, it's a criminal conspiracy, essentially. And the number of children who have been taken into care, the number of mothers who have been deprived of children, it's not just fathers. But uh, the denigration of the father is, is, um, is one of these particular agendas. And um, this programme is, is very denigrating to the father figure because uh, Pepper, Pepper Pig, right, this is what this programme's called. It's a very, very popular children's TV series. Um, Pepper Pig is a little, she's a little pig, a little anthropomorphic pig, who, who, it's an animated series, and she lives with her brother George in a house with her mother and father. And the father is a blundering fool, and he keeps making a, a complete arse out of himself, quite frankly, and a complete idiot of himself, and doing the most foolish things, and she says, oh, silly daddy, he's done it again. And this is just one example of the denigration of the father in society. On, in the media, there's many, many other examples, even in an advert. Have you seen the gravy adverts with Linda Bellingham? They're very, very famous. They've been running for a long time. Basically, it's, it's, the, it's a, like a short... Each advert is a short three-minute sitcom in which there's the sensible mother played by Linda Bellingham and two very precocious little brats of children. And then there's the father. I can't remember the name of the actor who plays the father. And he's quite a well-known actor. But he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a dribbling moron. He comes in and says, What's for dinner today, dear? What is it? And then, of course, the, the, she says, it's, it's the same as last year, it's the same as yesterday, dear. We're having the same thing again. Oh, really? And then the kids sort of roll their eyes and say, Dad, get with a picture, Dad. Surely you realise that, don't you? And, and they have various conversations like this, and the father always <coughs> is made the figure of fun. He's made the figure of a foolish. And there's many, many other examples I could give you. There are adverts where you see um, fathers and men generally, white men specifically, being made to look like idiots, being made to look incompetent, unintelligent and um, unsuited, based, frankly, for, 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 being, for being in a family. The yeah, oh, yeah. Now, I do like The Simpsons, I must admit, but, yeah, I mean, I do... Yeah, I mean, I do, but I, I do see that. I mean, Homer is, is a slightly cooler and slightly more um, sophisticated and um, creative version of this. And, I mean, I do enjoy it so much, and I, I don't like to think of that as part of this agenda, but, yeah, it's, it could well be. Now, this is Tracy Beaker. Have you seen this? You've seen Tracy Beaker. It's not on anymore, but it used to, it was a long-running children's TV drama series. And um, my daughter used to watch this, actually, and I wish I'd never let her watch it. Um, Tracy Beaker is a young girl. She's a likeable young girl who lives in local authority care. So we have here the orphan being made to look cool. So children will see that a, a child doesn't need parents. They can still be cool kids without parents. So if you're an orphan, don't worry. You don't need a mum and dad. You see what I mean? But children do need a mum and dad. They do. They do need, they need, they need love. They need parental love. And this is why um, the, the, if you can bring a child up without parental love, they're traumatised. And trauma to trauma, it doesn't have to be abuse like you get with Jimmy Savile, although that helps. As Brian Garris explains, there's a war on children. And this is extremely upsetting. But it, it has to be discussed. I mean, it would be far, far more ups upsetting if, um, if it was going on and we weren't talking about it, because then it, it wouldn't be exposed. Have I offended anyone yet? No? no. I'm not getting off this stage until I have at least one walkout. I promise you. We're going to talk about feminism now. Here is a trigger warning on what I'm about to say in this next segment of this talk. Feminism, it's surely it's something good, is it not? It's about women's rights, isn't it? You see, this is how it's portrayed. And indeed, there was a time when... Well, there's, there's, when people talk about feminism, they talk about first, first wave feminism, second wave feminism, third, third wave feminism. And in the first wave feminism, you could say there was a legitimate gripe. There was very, very obvious and very, very um, simple um, issues that, to do with women's rights in Western countries. For instance, women couldn't vote, women couldn't own property, there was, and several other things, women couldn't get certain jobs and stuff like that. And um, this is very easy, to, this is very tangible, this is a very, very tangible issue. 
and it has been solved. Women do vote, women can own property now. Yet, um, it seems as if feminism is never bigger and more, it's never more bigger and more establishment than it is today. And you'll find that feminists are still claiming that there is, uh, that there's women's rights issues in the world today. But when you ask them to describe these issues, they will use some very, very, very strange, very slippery and very, very flowery language. And they'll, they'll use phrases like um, microaggression and um, cisgender and heteronormative. And they'll say that these are problems of the world today. And the fact of the matter is, I've asked, if you ask for an explanation of what these things are, you just get a more gobbledygook as an, ex as an explanation. There's no real... It's, it's not comprehensive. It's not the sort of thing you can normally get into. So you wonder, you wonder exactly what's going on here. Now, this is a picture taken in the 1960s at a feminist event. This is, and you see a women of the world unite. <laughs> well, that phrase there is actually an adaptation of a fra of a inscription, the epitaph, on the tomb of Karl Marx, which I showed to you before. The, the, the 1955 monument that was put up in Highgate Cemetery. It says, "Workers of all lands unite." And here we have work. Sometimes it's translated as "workers of the world unite." We have nothing to lose but our change. Here we have. Women of the world unite. But who are they uniting for or against? And again, you get some very, very... Um, there's, some, there's no real obvious answers. When you ask this question, it's hard to get obvious answers or very, very simple answers from the feminists. And, I mean, the, good, the, the number of women who self-identify as feminists is now dropping, which is a good idea. It's down to 18% in this country. It was 22% at its highest. However, those who identify as feminists tend to be in elite positions of power, and that's not by accident. It is by design. I mean, they, they, I don't think the authorities care which women are feminists or how many women are feminists, as long as the right kind of women are feminists. That's the point. So they unite. Women of the world unite. Unite against... A, and they'll, say, they'll use words such, like I say, m microaggression, misogyny. Misogyny means a hatred of women. So they're, they're fighting against hatred of women. And um, if, you, if you then say... They'll, they'll often then accuse certain people, certain, men, certain white men specifically, of being misogynists, they'll accuse them and they'll say to them, well, you, you're a misogynist, which means you hate women. But when you actually look at these men who they're accusing, there doesn't seem to be any hatred of women in, in many of those men. I mean, for example, a good example is Milo Yiannopoulos, who's been, who's been quite um, a, a harsh critic of feminism within the mainstream media. He's been called a misogynist, yet um, he doesn't hate women. So what, what, so what is this? It's, it's rather like the racist thing I talked about earlier. It's part of cultural Marxism. I talked about how you're a racist if you ask for a black coffee. You're a misogynist if you, don't, if, you, if you disagree with feminism in any way. So if you ask for a black coffee, you hate black people. If you, if you criticise feminism in any way, or even ask to question it in any way, you hate women. And it's logically unsustainable on the most basic, crude level. Yet this is believed by mainstream, and it is promoted by the BBC and other people in the media. You could say then that if you criticise Karl Marx, that means you're a raping capitalist. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's well, yeah. logical inconsistency is not, is not very well. Now, we have, this, is a, this is a women-only coach on a train. This is a women-only coach. This is actually in Brazil, this particular train. But they're, they're thinking of bringing them in in this country. Um, now, this is a compartment on the railways, on a train. This is for female passengers only. And it is intended to, the, the attention, the reason behind it is, is supposedly to protect women passengers from violent crime on the railways. Now, violent crime on the railways is a very, very, is an issue. It is an important issue. And it's, in fact, last year there were 1,100 reported crimes against women passengers on the railway network. So the solution, now, um, that's the, that is, this is the proposed solution, is to, is to shut women away in their own compartments. Now, um, there are other solutions I can think of to that, because I do believe it's a problem that needs to be addressed. Now, first of all, we gave up our, our privacy, didn't we? Do you remember? We gave up our privacy, and we allowed them to install CCTV cameras everywhere on the railway network. You can't travel by train or even walk down a platform. I mean, you, you can go into a railway toilet, that's about it now, without being observed by a, TV, by, by a CCTV camera. We were told this would reduce crime on the railways, and it hasn't. Crime's increased. Well, what goes for the railway goes every, for everywhere else. We, we have CCTV cameras everywhere. It hasn't solved the crime problem. Now, um, last year there was a strike on the railways because uh, rail trains have two members of crew usually. They have a driver and they have a conductor. The driver, of course, is there to drive the train. 
The conductor's job is to work, is to work, operate within the cabin of the railways. He checks your tickets, um, looks out for fires. If there's a fire or a crash or anything like that, he's trained to, to provide first aid for passengers to get them off the train. It's, his job is to, to care for the passengers. And one of the conductor's jobs is to protect the passengers from violent crime. Now, the strike was all about the fact that many railway networks are now removing the conductors and they're having driver-only trains. My solution is that that is wrong. If you want to stop crime, you have to keep the conductor for a start. And so these are the proposals I would suggest. Um, being a misogynist, of course, I, uh, I don't care about women. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um, no, no, that's far too simple for these people. No, no, you have to bring in this apartheid system on the railway network where um, the sexes are separated. And then, the, uh, firstly, this won't protect women from violent crime because anyone who's, an, who's any nut job on the train is not going to let a, a sign like that stop him getting on board that ca compartment. <coughs> And secondly, it's giving out a bad message. It's giving out the message that women and men are enemies, not just violent criminals, but all, all white men are enemies of all women. That's what it's saying. We, we all, all of us are components in a political dynamic. All women are victims. We are, we're not, they're not individuals. None of you women are individuals. You're components in a political dynamic and nothing more. And you are, you are part of a, a dialectic which involves... Uh, an, an oppression of being a victim of another political, another, compo another big political dynamic, which is all men, all white men specifically. And that includes me. I'm not an individual. I'm not able to. I'm not able to function as an individual. I am just a component of a political dynamic. And I am a rapist, even though I never committed an act of rape and don't believe I ever would. I'm still a rapist because I'm a white male. That is. This, this is literally what they're saying, and we. And therefore, we have to be locked away from each other and taught to fear and hate each other. And in, well, in the case of white males, we've been taught to hate ourselves as well as, and, and, and believe that we are something bad. This is, this is not because the, the New World Order dislikes white people more than black people or anything like that. It's because it's all, it's all strategic. It's all a part of a strategy. Now, this is an actress, 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 actor. You can't say the word actress anymore. It's gone down the memory hole. It's been struck from the New Speak Dictionary. But I say actress. Her name is Jodie Whittaker. Now, she's the new Doctor Who. Now, this is really, well, this is weird, isn't it? Because they've, Doctor Who's a long-running science fiction series, and they've suddenly decided to cast a, a, female, a, a female thespian to play this role. Now, that, is, that has been extremely controversial. And the problem with it is, is that there's been no real proper debate about this. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan of the series anymore. I used to be, but it's, it's really gone downhill the last couple of years, I must say. So I stopped really enjoying this series long before this happened. However, um, I mean, I remember Tom Baker. Do you remember Tom Baker and Peter Davidson? They were, I loved them. They were great. But they've, um, they, by bringing, this, by bringing um, a woman into play this, it's like they, it, it's part of this confusion thing. They are now taking a, a well-loved national institution and they're changing the fundamentally on a gender level, on a sexual level. And there's been no debate about this at all. People who object to being called man babies and misogynists. Oh, yeah. Oh, right, I'm, that's after I stopped watching it, because I went... Yeah, but I used to love, I used to love the master when he was that guy with black beard. He was cool. But, um, now... That, I haven't heard about that, no. <laughs> JBR, uh, but you see, this is, I mean, I would find it equally galling. I, I, would, I would object just as much. I would find it equally galling if someone decided to remake Miss Marple as Mr. Marple. I, I think that character should be a woman. And it wouldn't work. It would be, I would be just as annoyed if they did that. I would be, if they tried to, you remember the films with Eddie, um, Eddie Murphy? There's comedy films with Eddie Murphy, the black actor. If they decided to remake those films with a white actor playing that character, I would be equally upset and equally indignant as I am that this has happened. This is not about uh, racial preferences or sexism. This is about simply realism. It's about, con it's about continuity. Because this, again, this is a change. This is a fundamental change. They're upsetting things again. And it, we're going to be in a very Orwellian situation when the first series comes out because the BBC are going to hype it like it's never been hyped before. Every, every reviewer is going to give it glowing criticism, because they won't dare do anything else, because they don't want to be misogynists. Because it's the only, the only criticism, there's no other recourse other than misogyny for why you would object 
to anything in this program. You have to give it A+, plus, otherwise you're a misogynist. doesn't matter what reason your reasons are for not liking it, you still have to call it. And, um, and the thing is that the fans, the fans of Doctor Who are going to just... They're going to reject it. I know already on Doctor Who forums and in Facebook groups, they're saying it's crazy. It's going to be a massive hey, blow. That's another thing. Anybody who criticizes the state of Israel is a Jew hating. I know, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's, that's, they, David Icke's been affected by that. So we have um, this very, very upsetting and very, very debilitating situation, which again is causing conflict, it's causing, it's causing division, and it's causing confusion and upset and discomfort. Insecurity among all people. I mean, the, the response from many, from the, say, the Guardian, which is one of the biggest cultural Marxist sort of probe cultural Marxist papers, has been, oh, it's wonderful this has happened. You know, if only, why didn't they have a black woman though? You know, it's, so she's now, she, now they've got a white woman. And it's not good enough because they're racists. Now this is the. Let's just 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 bury the, get rid of this idea that feminists aren't interested in women's rights. At least the institution of feminism is. Um, there, there are exceptions, but this is the embassy of Saudi Arabia in London. Now you, you get massive protests by feminism uh, feminists um, outside universities and places like that, where the the professor might have used a politically incorrect term. He might have said mankind instead of humankind or something like that, and there'll be massive protests by these, these triggered feminists. Um, they, were, they may well walk past this building on their way to the, the big demonstration outside the college and not give it a second look. But this is this, fa this most favoured nation of the West because it's a massive oil producer, Saudi Arabia. It has one of the worst women's rights records on earth. Women in that country are a little better than slaves. They, they're not allowed to drive cars. They have no political power. They have no independent, authority, no, no independent sovereignty outside their family. They can't do almost anything without the permission of a male relative or their husband. They can be beheaded publicly in the middle of a city square for nothing more than cheating on their husband. Um, in fact, Saudi Arabia actually executed by beheading 150 people during the same period that it's believed the Islamic State of, uh, of um, Iraq and the Levant um, executed by beheading about 110 people. Yet, they're dropping bombs on ISIS and this is we're sending armaments to Saudi Arabia, we're sending money to them, we're buying their oil, and no one gives a damn. So, um, I think until feminists are linking arms around this building, I'm afraid I can't take them seriously.